Chapter 6 Is the Church the Bride of the Lamb? One of the first positions generally taken by the ultra-dispensationalists is that it is unthinkable that the Church should be the body of Christ, and yet at the same time be identified with the Bride of the Lamb. They insist that there is a mixing of figures here, which is utterly untenable. How, they ask with scorn, could the Church be both the Bride and a part of the body of the Bridegroom? The issue is not that God could not make us both, although it would not make sense if He did. The issue is that God did not make us both. The term body of Christ is found four times in Scripture, and they are all in Paul's epistles and they only apply to us today. Romans 7 verse 4, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 16, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 27, and Ephesians 4 verse 12. With regard to Israel being the bride, the entire book of Song of Solomon shows Israel as the bride. The parable of Matthew 25 verses 1 to 13 shows Israel as the bride and Jesus as the groom. John referred to Jesus as the groom and Israel as the bride in John 3 verse 29. Revelation 19 verses 7 to 9 refers to Jesus marrying Israel. Revelation 21 verse 9 calls Jerusalem the bride, the Lamb's wife. Revelation 22 verse 17 refers to Israel as the bride. Isaiah 62 verses 1 to 5 says that Israel's name will be changed to married when God rejoices over her. Even when Paul likens the body of Christ to Christ's wife, he never calls us Christ's wife. He says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body, Ephesians 5 verse 23. If ever we were called Christ's wife, it would be in that passage, but we are still called the body, even in the context of marriage. Therefore, the scriptural evidence leads us to conclude that Israel is the bride of Christ, and we today are the body of Christ. This is not a distinction that ultra-dispensationalists made up. Rather, it is a distinction that God makes in His Holy Word. Some even go farther and suggest that Christians who all down through the centuries have had no difficulty as to the two figures, recognizing the fact that they are figures, since the Bible never tells us that they are figures, I disagree about them being figures. Again, Ironside relies upon man's church history as being authoritative above the Word of God. Basically, Ironside is saying that all of the scripture I cited is wrong, while man is right, and therefore that there need be no confusion in thought when it comes to harmonizing both, are actually guilty of charging deity with spiritual polygamy. Spiritual polygamy? I think Ironside's parents failed to explain what marriage is. Marriage is between one man and one woman, as defined by God in Genesis 2 verses 22 to 25. The body of Christ, since it is his body, is part of Christ, the bridegroom. The lamb's wife, since it is his wife, is his bride. That is one man and one woman getting married. It is not one man marrying multiple women. This would be so much easier for Ironside if he would just believe what God's word says. I would not put such an abominable thought in writing, you just did, but it is their own expression which I have heard again and again. There is nothing abominable about a man, Christ, marrying a woman, Israel. Rather, marriage is a divine institution ordained by God. They point out, what all Bible students readily admit, that in the Old Testament, Israel is called the bride and the wife of Jehovah. Then, they exclaim, how can the Lord have two wives without being guilty of the very thing that he himself condemns in his creatures here on earth? The problem is that Ironside brings up an argument by his opponent that is flawed. Instead of the argument that the body of Christ is not the wife of Christ, it is the body. Also, Ironside makes it sound like the body of Christ is made up by his opponents to avoid the spiritual polygamy view, which is weird because Ironside has been arguing for a body of Christ that starts in Acts 2. Quite simply, God has told us in his word that Israel is the bride, and that we, as the body of Christ, are part of the bridegroom. There is nothing made up by right dividers to make their theory work. Our view is 100% consistent with the truth of God's word. In view of such absurd deductions, it will be necessary to examine with some care just how these figures are used. Fundamental Christianity will say that certain things are to be taken only spiritually or certain things are only figures. If the Bible does not specifically tell you this, then you do not know this. If the body of Christ is a figure, then maybe salvation by the blood of Christ is a figure. Then, I do not believe in his blood as atonement for my sins, 
and I go to hell for all eternity. This shows the danger of thinking that things are figures. Whenever man takes what the Bible actually says and makes it a figure, he is just changing scripture to fit his view, unless we are told in scripture that it is a figure. Since the bride of Christ and the body of Christ are never specifically identified as figures, we should not take them as such. They are both literal. In the first place, we find God using a number of different figurative expressions in speaking of Israel. He declares himself to be their father, that is, the father of the nation, and Israel is called his son. Out of Egypt have I called my son. Hosea 11 verse 1. And, let my son go, that he may serve me. Exodus. For 23, again, this is not a figure. God called Abram and started the nation of Israel. Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3. God promised that he would give Abraham a son of Sarah's womb. Genesis 17 verse 16. Isaac was born, and he was born after both Abraham and Sarah did not have the natural ability to have children. The way that Isaac was born was that the Lord visited Sarah, for Sarah conceived, and bare Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. Genesis 21 verses 1 to 2. Romans 4 verses 19 to 21 describes this in easier to understand terms by saying, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that, what he had promised, he was able also to perform. It was God who performed the birth of Isaac, which means that Israel was birthed of God, making Israel God's son, which is not a figure. It literally happened. In other places similar expressions are used, and yet the prophets again and again speak of Israel as the wife of Jehovah, yes, Israel is also Jehovah's wife, because God entered into a covenant relationship with her, which is what marriage is, and the later prophets depict her as a divorced wife, because of her unfaithfulness, God divorced Israel due to them being apostate. Deuteronomy 32 verse 21 says, They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God, they have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people, I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Jesus gives more detail on this by saying, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, apostate Israel, and given to a nation, believing Israel, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Matthew 21 verse 43. Then, Luke 12 verse 32 says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Putting these three verses together, we learn that God divorced Israel, and he will marry the little flock of Israel in the future, who are all believers from Israel throughout their dispensation. This group of believers is called the Israel of God, Galatians 6 verse 16, someday to be received back again when she has been purged from her sins. But it is important to see that a divorced wife can never again be a bride, and apostate Israel will never be God's bride again. God divorced unbelieving Israel, while staying true to believing Israel, with the official marriage supper being held after Jesus' second coming. Revelation 19 verses 7 to 9. Jesus told apostate Israel, Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Matthew 23 verse 33. The answer is that they cannot. In summary, God married all of Israel and then divorced apostate Israel. In the tribulation period, he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, and as in former years. Malachi 3 verses 3 to 4. So, God marries Israel, they become apostate, and he divorces the apostates. Then, he purifies the little flock so that his wife hath made herself ready, Revelation 19 verse 7, for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Therefore, the divorced wife does not become God's bride again. Rather, God takes the scarlet sins of believing Israel and makes them white as snow, Isaiah 1 verse 18, so that they may dwell in the house of the Lord forever, Psalm 23 verse 6, even though she may be forgiven and restored to her wifely estate. So, is Ironside saying that the blood of Christ forgives her sins, but does not atone for her sins, because she can never be better than what she was before her sins? This is completely inconsistent with scripture. Today, if you have trusted in the death, burial, 
and resurrection of Christ as atonement for your sins, you are a saint, blessed, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 3. This is something that Adam never had before he sinned. God not only restores us through the blood of Christ, but he puts us in a better position than what we are in before sin came, because we are made spiritually alive in Christ, Ephesians 2 verse 1. How dare Ironside blaspheme God and his provision through Christ by saying that Israel is a worse situation under the new covenant than under the old covenant. The book of Hebrews teaches just the opposite. What incongruity do we have here if we are to interpret scripture on the principle of the Bullingerites? Here is a son who is also a wife. I am both a son and a husband. There is nothing strange about that. I just have different roles with different people. The Godhead has three members God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. When God calls Israel his son, he speaks as God the Father. When God calls Israel his bride, he speaks as God the Son. The difference in gender also should not be an issue. God made Adam a complete human being. He then took a rib out of Adam's side and made another human being, called a woman, taking some of Adam's characteristics out of him and giving them to the woman. The woman, then, is just like the man, except that she has different characteristics than the man does. However, in the body of Christ, Galatians 3 verse 28, there is no male or female, because we are all made complete in Christ, Colossians 2 verse 10. In other words, characteristics from both genders are to be embodied in each member of the body of Christ, such that the distinction between man and woman is done away. Similarly, in Israel's program, Jesus said, in the resurrection they neither marry, nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven, Matthew 22 verse 30, meaning that there is also no male or female in the bride of Christ, Israel. Thus, Israel can be both male and female, son and bride, and there be nothing strange about it. In fact, it would be strange if Israel was not called both son and bride by God. What utter absurdity! Then again we have Israel depicted as a vine. God brought a vine out of Egypt. Psalms 80 verse 8. And Israel is an empty vine, he bringeth forth fruit for himself. Hosea 10 verse 1. In many other places, the same figure is used. We can deduce from reading Genesis 1 to 3 and Judges 9 verses 7 to 15 that a vine, in the scripture, represents a nation. Numbers. 23 colon 9 states that Israel shall not be reckoned among the nations. Therefore, when God calls Israel a vine, he is referring to them being a nation apart from other nations. Elsewhere we have this favored nation, aha, uh -huh. Ironside recognizes Israel's favored nation status, as well, spoken of as the priests of the Lord, occupying a special position throughout all the millennium, as though they were intermediaries between the Gentiles and Jehovah himself. Not as though they were intermediaries, but Israel is the intermediary between the Gentiles and God. God said, Ye shall be a kingdom of priests, and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, Exodus 19 verse 6. Isaiah 61 verse 6 says to Israel, Ye shall be named the priests of the Lord, men shall call you the ministers of our God, ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles. Since they are intermediaries, they are called to go ye therefore and teach all nations, Matthew 28 verse 19. That is why Zechariah 8 verse 23 says, that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. If you say this is a figure, you must change the very clear words of the Bible. You must say, well, the Jews are not really priests. God does not really mean for them to teach all nations. They are not really Jews, going to the Gentiles. You have to change the scripture in multiple places to believe the Jews, being called priests, is a figure. Other similitudes are used, but these are enough to show that there is no attempt made in scripture to harmonize every figure. I just explained each so-called figure that Ironside mentioned is true, and God uses the different terms because they mean different things that Israel will be. A similar thing can be said about Jesus Christ. He is called many names by God. Would Ironside say, these are just figures? 
Jesus is not really wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9 verse 6, These names are all accurate descriptions of the roles Jesus Christ will fill in God's everlasting kingdom on earth. The same holds true, then, for the many names God has given Israel, but, if you discard things because they do not agree with your religious beliefs, you miss the richness of the blessings Israel has in Christ, the richness of who Christ is for Israel, and, for us, the exceeding riches of God's grace and His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2 verse 7. These words in Paul's Epistles are not platitudes. They actually mean what they say, but Christians have no idea that this is the case, because unbelievers, like Ironside, tell them they are just figures. Each one is used as suit God's purpose for the moment. So the nation which at one time is viewed as a son is seen on another occasion as a vine, and elsewhere as a wife, and again as a nation of priests. And, I have explained how Israel fits into each of these roles. This being so in connection with Israel, why need we be surprised if a similar diversity of terms is used in connection with the church? Yes, if God blesses Israel with multiple roles, He will bless the body of Christ with multiple roles, as well. When our Lord first introduces the subject of the new order, He speaks of the church as a building. Upon this rock I will build my church, Matt. 1618. There is no new order spoken of here. Jesus is still speaking to the nation of Israel. In fact, in the previous chapter, Jesus said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 15 verse 24. The church that Christ speaks of here is the same church that was in the wilderness in Moses' day, Acts 7 verse 38. The Apostle Paul views the church in the same way in 1 Corinthians 3 verses 9 and 10, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. Ye are God's building. God's building is the place where God dwells. God dwells in his building with his wife in God's kingdom on earth, and he dwells in his building with his body in God's kingdom in heaven. People can have two homes, a summer home and a winter home, and no one thinks that is strange. Why, then, couldn't God, who can be in more than one place at once, have two homes one for his body and one for his bride? Again in Ephesians 2 verses 19 to 22, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. In regard to this passage, please take note that if the Bullingerites are correct, we have here a building suspended in the air with a great gap between the foundation and the superstructure. 4. This building is said to rest upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, but according to the views of those we are discussing, we must separate in a very definite way the New Testament apostles and prophets of the book of Acts from the Ephesian church, which is supposed to be a different company altogether. Ironside fails to recognize two distinct groups of apostles and prophets in the New Testament. Jesus chose 12 apostles in Matthew John. Then, Ephesians 4 verses 7 to 13 says that when he ascended up on high, he gave some apostles and some prophets. Therefore, if Jesus chose apostles in his earthly ministry and he chose apostles after his ascension, there are two distinct groups of apostles and prophets. The former group was for Israel's program, and the latter group is for the body of Christ. The apostles and prophets of the body of Christ were given till we all come in the unity of the faith, Ephesians 4 verse 13, which is until the Bible is complete. We learn from 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37 that a prophet's job was to determine which of Paul's epistles were scripture and which were not. Therefore, there is no gap between the foundation and the superstructure, as Ironside claims. Rather, Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection is the chief cornerstone, and the foundation is the revelation of Jesus Christ of mystery doctrine given to Paul, Galatians 1 verse 12 and confirmed by apostles and prophets, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37, that Jesus Christ gave to the body of Christ, Ephesians 4 verse 11. The absurdity of this becomes the more apparent as we see how we would have to do damage to the picture of the building is used here by the Apostle Paul. 
The fact is the church of Acts and that of the prison epistles is one and indivisible. A church is a group of believers. The believing remnant of Israel believed the gospel of the kingdom. The body of Christ believes the gospel of grace. Since we are all believers, you can say that we are all part of God's church. However, in the sense that we were given different things by God to believe, we are different groups of believers. If the two groups do not believe different things, there would not have been much disputing. Acts 15 verse 7, between Paul and the twelve apostles of Israel's dispensation. The body and the bride are not the same, although they both belong to Christ. Therefore, Israel and the body are not the same, even though they can both be classified as the church, since they both belong to Christ. In 1 Timothy 3 verse 15, he speaks of the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar, and ground of the truth. The Apostle Peter looks at the church in exactly the same way, as a company of living stones built upon the living stone, our Lord Jesus Christ, one pet. 2 colon 5. In 1 Timothy, Paul is referring to proper behavior among the body of Christ, since the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. In 1 Peter, Peter is talking about the believing remnant of Israel being lively stones to go out to the Gentiles with the gospel of the kingdom and the law covenant during Jesus' millennial reign. I notice that Ironside does not quote 1 Peter 2 verse 5, as he quoted 1 Timothy 3 verse 15. That is because 1 Peter 2 verse 5 also says that Israel is an holy priesthood, which goes in line with Israel being a kingdom of priests to reach the Gentiles in the kingdom, Exodus 19 verse 6, Isaiah 61 verse 6. John the Baptist said, Think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham, Matthew 3 verse 9. Jesus said, in reference to the believing remnant that, if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out, Luke 19 verse 40. In other words, stones are a reference to the believing remnant of Israel that will go out to the Gentiles with the gospel of the kingdom, while the church of the living God is a reference to believers in the mystery dispensation. Therefore, Paul and Peter are not talking about the same thing. We have already seen that the figure of the body, there he goes again by saying that something is a figure. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 27 very clearly says, Ye are the body of Christ, which shows that the body is not a figure, is used in a number of Paul's writings, not only in the prison epistles, but in Romans and 1 Corinthians, to set forth the intimate relationship subsisting between Christ in glory and his people on earth. Correction. The body sets forth the intimate relationship between Christ and his people of today's dispensation, who will live forever with him in heaven and, as far as God is concerned, are already there, e.g., Ephesians 2 verses 5 to 6 and Philippians 3 verse 20, whereas the house expresses stability and tells us that the church is a dwelling place for God in this world, as the temple was of old. The church, the body of Christ, is only part of the dwelling place for God. The most important part, the chief cornerstone, is Jesus Christ. The next most important part is the foundation of the house, which is the word of Jesus Christ to us today via the Apostle Paul. The body of Christ is then the building fitly framed together, Ephesians 2 verses 19 to 22. This tells us that the dwelling place for God in the dispensation of grace is a spiritual house. We should note that this is separate from the house of God for Israel's program. Jesus told the twelve apostles that his father's house was already built, and that he went to prepare a place for believing Israel within that house, John 14 verse 2, dot. The body speaks of union with Christ by the indwelling spirit. But Paul sees no incongruity whatever in changing the figure from that of the body to the bride. In the fifth chapter of Ephesians he glides readily from one to the other, and no violence whatever is done to either view. Paul does not glide from one to the other. Paul talks about the mystery in Ephesians 3. Then, he talks about the unity of the body in Ephesians 4 verses 1 to 16. Then, he gives practical application of how the body should treat each other in Ephesians 4 verses 17 to 32. Then, in Ephesians 5 verses 1 to 20, he talks about how different we are from the world. Then, in Ephesians 5 verses 21 to 33, he talks about how we should treat each other at home. Then, in Ephesians 6, he talks about how we should act in the world. 
Thus, there is no gliding from body to bride. Rather, Ephesians 5 verses 21 to 33 is practical application of mystery doctrine for husbands and wives that is within a larger practical application section of mystery doctrine and has nothing to do with Israel, the bride of Christ. He shows us that a man's wife is to be regarded as his own body. And in the latter part of that chapter, where he goes back to the marriage relationship as originally established by God, he says, Therefore as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot, or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies, he that loveth his. Wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the Church, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the Church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband, verses 24 to 33. Surely nothing could be plainer than that we are to understand the relationship of Adam and Eve at the very beginning was intended by God to set forth the great mystery of Christ and the church. In marriage, the man and the woman become one flesh. They are one body. In other words, as far as the flesh is concerned, the man's body and the woman's body are one. As such, the husband and wife should take care of each other as they would take care of their own bodies, because the other person is part of their body. To illustrate this, Paul tells of how Christ takes care of his own body, the church. Paul is just using an analogy that the Ephesians already understand in order to explain the relationship that should be present between a husband and a wife. Not once in the passage does Paul refer to the body of Christ as Christ's wife. In fact, Paul says that Christ sanctifies and washes the church, and then says, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies, Ephesians 5 verse 28. In other words, Paul uses the relationship between Christ and his body to show that husbands and wives should take care of each as they do their own bodies, which shows that the church today is Christ's body. Writing to the Corinthians at an earlier date, he said, I have espoused you as a chaste virgin unto Christ, and Christian behavior is shown to spring from the responsibility connected with that espousal. The church is viewed as an affianced bride, not yet married, but called upon to be faithful to her absent Lord until the day when she will be openly acknowledged by him as his bride. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2 is the scripture reference here. First, we should note that the Corinthians are espoused, which means they are engaged to be married but are not married yet. This is important to note because 1 Corinthians 12 verse 27 says, Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. Therefore, Paul cannot be talking about the same thing in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2 as he is in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 27, because they are already part of the body of Christ, but they are engaged to be married in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2. In other words, in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2, Paul is not talking about them being married to Christ. Second, we should note that Ironside misquoted the passage to fit his belief. As Ironside misquoted it, it sounds like the Corinthians are espoused to Christ. However, the passage really reads, I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. We now need to look at the context to see what this one husband is. The context is the battle for the mind. This is seen by looking at the next verse. I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3. How ironic that Ironside uses subtlety by misquoting the previous verse to get people away from the simplicity that is in Christ. Before this, Paul mentioned to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5. What Paul is saying, then, is that the Corinthians are saved, 
but they are not using the mind of Christ that they have. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16. So, the one husband that Paul has espoused the Corinthians to is not Christ himself, but the mind of Christ. If they use the mind of Christ, not allowing it to be corrupted by the serpent through people who preach another Jesus, another spirit, or another gospel, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 4, then they will be presented as a chaste virgin to Christ, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2. If not, then Christ himself will have to cleanse them of the religion that is in their corrupted minds through the fire on the day of judgment, 1 Corinthians 3 verses 12 to 15. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 17, meaning that the impurities will be destroyed on judgment day. Paul's prayer is that, if the Corinthians stay true to the one husband of the mind of Christ, then there will be no impurities and Paul can present them to Christ as chaste. Virgins, who are part of his body, if Christ were the one husband, the verse would read, For I have espoused you to Christ, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to him. Instead, it reads, For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. By reading the context, we see the battle is the mind. Furthermore, Paul gives examples of this to the Philippians. First, he tells the Philippians to let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, Philippians 2 verse 5. Then, he shows Timothy as being like-minded, Philippians 2 verse 20. Then, we see Epaphroditus having this mind, such that for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, Philippians 2 verse 30. Then, Paul himself says that his goal is to know Christ, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, Philippians 3 verse 10. Thus, Paul tells the Philippians to be espoused to the mind of Christ, and then he gives the examples of Timothy, Epaphroditus, and himself to show, practically speaking, what a chaste virgin for Christ looks like. It is this glorious occasion that John brings before us in the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation. It is of no earthly bride he is speaking, but of the heavenly, in the sense that Jesus marries the Israel of God, Galatians 6 verse 16, which are all believing Jews and does not include unbelieving Jews, yes, Israel is a heavenly bride. However, their home is in God's kingdom on earth, not in heaven. Revelation 21 verse 2 says that John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. When an angel tells John that he will show him the bride, the Lamb's wife, Revelation 21 verse 9, he carries him to a high mountain on earth to shew him that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, Revelation 21 verse 10. Therefore, the bride of Christ is new Jerusalem on earth with believing Israel in it. After the destruction of the false harlot, Babylon the Great, the marriage supper of the Lamb is celebrated in the Father's house and all saints are called upon to rejoice, because the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready. This is Israel not the church. Ironside has the two programs confused here. If he understood how to rightly divide the word of truth, he would know that only Israel could make herself ready, Revelation 19 verse 7, because she has to keep her salvation by works, James 2 verse 24. By contrast, the body of Christ is sanctified by Christ to present it to himself a glorious church, Ephesians 5 verses 26 to 27. This is in perfect alignment with a wedding. The groom takes care of his body, while the wife takes care of her body. As the body of Christ, Christ has made us ready through his death on the cross. As the bride of Christ, Israel has made herself ready by enduring unto the end of the tribulation period, Matthew 24 verse 13. Dot. At the judgment seat of Christ, she receives from his hand the linen garments in which she is to be arrayed at the marriage feast. Because the wife hath made herself ready, Revelation 19 verse 7, by trusting in God to save her under the law covenant he made with her, she is given God's righteousness to wear as her wedding garment, Revelation 19 verse 8. It is after the marriage supper that judgment was given unto them to rule in God's kingdom on earth, Revelation 20 verse 4. This is separate from the judgment seat of Christ, described in 1 Corinthians 3 verses 11 to 15, where members of the body of Christ receive their positions in heavenly places.
Saved Israel receives her linen garments when she comes out of the tribulation period. Revelation 6 verses 9 to 11, not at the judgment seat of Christ, because she never goes to that judgment. The judgment seat of Christ is specifically reserved for the body of Christ and has to do with receiving a reward. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 14, not with receiving a wedding garment. Note that on this occasion, we have not only the bride and the bridegroom, but we read, blessed are they that are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. These invited guests are distinguished from the bride herself. They of course are another group of redeemed sinners, namely, Old Testament saints, and possibly some tribulation saints who have been martyred for Christ's sake. Huh? Old Testament saints? Some tribulation saints who have been martyred for Christ's sake. So, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to whom the promises were made, do not ever receive the promises God gave them because they are just friends of the bridegroom, but only the New Testament saints receive the kingdom. Sorry, David. I know God said to you, that he will make thee a house, 2 Samuel 7 verse 11, and God specifically says that David my servant shall be king over them, Ezekiel 37 verse 24, but Ironside says you are only God's friend. You do not get to rule with him forever. Oh well, better luck next time. This is blasphemy of the highest order. Instead of making up ridiculous things out of thin air, Ironside should at least. Admit that he has no clue who these people are, because he does not rightly divide the word of truth. Jesus' parable in Matthew 22 verses 1 to 14 explains that those bidden to the wedding, Matthew 22 verse 3, i.e., apostate Israel, do not believe. Therefore, they would not come, Matthew 22 verse 3. God then gathers the believing remnant of Israel, and they marry Jesus Christ and enter the kingdom, Matthew 22 verses 8 to 10. These are not guests that are not part of the ceremony. They are the bride. Remember that Revelation 21 verses 9 to 10 defines the bride as holy Jerusalem. God marries the city, and the people in it are part of the bride. Isaiah 62 verse 4 says, The Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. Therefore, those called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb, arrayed in fine linen, clean and white are the bride. Revelation 19 verses 8 to 9. Dot. These are the friends of the bridegroom who rejoice in his happiness when he takes his bride to himself. I assume Aaronside is referring to John 3 verse 29, where John the Baptist says, The friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. All John is saying is that he is not the Christ, John 3 verse 28, and so he rejoices in Israel's attention, shifting away from him and toward Christ, John 3 verse 30. Spiritually speaking, John is part of saved Israel. Therefore, he is part of Christ's bride. All down through the Christian centuries believers have reveled in the sweetness of the thought of the bridal relationship, setting forth, as no other figure does, the intensity of Christ's love for his own. Wouldn't the body of Christ be just as close to Christ as the bride of Christ will be? Given Ironside's recent comment about friends of the bridegroom, Consider this, Jesus told the bride, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. John 15 verses 13 to 14. Yet, God tells the body of Christ God commendeth his love toward us, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5 verse 8. Therefore, if Ironside wants to talk about the intensity of Christ's love, an argument can be made that a greater intensity of Christ's love has been given to his body than to his bride. How truly we may sing. The bride eyes not her garment, but her dear bridegroom's face. I will not gaze on glory, but on my King of grace, not at the crown he giveth, but on his pierced hand, the Lamb is all the glory of Emmanuel's land. How much we would lose if we lost this? No. Rather, how much Israel would lose if this were true of us today? If we are both the body and bride of Christ today, then there is no salvation for the nation of Israel. How selfish of Christians to claim they are spiritual Israel, so that all of God's promises for all dispensations are given to us today, to the exclusion of all other people. In our dispensation alone, God hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, Ephesians 1 verse 3. Must we also steal Israel's blessings in earthly places in Christ to keep for ourselves, as well? 
It is not surprising, then, that Ironside does not consider Old Testament saints to be part of the Bride of Christ, since he selfishly hogs all of God's blessings upon mankind for the body of Christ exclusively. And yet one is pained, sometimes, to realize how insensible Christians who ought to know better, can be as to its preciousness. I am pained to see Christians exclude God's chosen people, the nation of Israel, from realizing the promises that God has promised them. In a sense, Christians think they are God, because they can change what God has said to suit their fancy. I remember on one occasion hearing an advocate of the system we are reviewing exclaim, I am not part of the bride, I am part of the bridegroom himself. I belong to Christ's body, and his body is far more precious to him than his bride. I replied, you mean then that you think far more of your own body than you do of your wife. He was rather taken back, as he might well be. Ironside was appealing to the man's pride, rather than the word of God, to make his point. Ephesians 5 verse 29 says, No man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. This tells us that the Lord nourishes and cherishes the church as his own body. But after all, if Israel is a divorced wife to be restored someday, and the church is also a bride, is there not ground for what some have called spiritual polygamy? In this paper, Ironside has accused Christ of spiritual polygamy if this were the case. As I have already explained, the body of Christ belongs to the man, Christ Jesus. The bride of Christ is his wife, Israel. A man marrying a woman is how God designed marriage. There is no spiritual polygamy here. Certainly not. Similar figures may be used in each dispensation to illustrate spiritual realities. And then it is important to see that Israel is distinctively called the wife of Jehovah, whereas the church is the bride of the Lamb. Where are these distinct names given? The term wife of Jehovah is nowhere to be found in scripture. The closest reference to the bride of the Lamb is found in Revelation 21 verse 9. This verse says that an angel will show John the bride, the Lamb's wife, and then John sees that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, Revelation 21 verse 10. Therefore, the bride of the Lamb is the holy Jerusalem, it is not the church. Furthermore, Jehovah is God the Father, while the Lamb is God the Son. Therefore, if Israel is the wife of Jehovah and the church is the bride of the Lamb, then they are married to two different members of the Godhead. Israel's nuptial relationship is with God himself apart altogether from any question of incarnation. The church is the bride of the incarnate one who became the Lamb of God for our redemption. Who would want to lose the blessedness of this? Ironside needs to stop writing this paper, because he commits greater blasphemy as he continues. Here goes Ironside, changing his position again. Before, he stated that there cannot be two brides, because Christ would be guilty of spiritual polygamy. Therefore, we are all one both Israel and the body of Christ. Now, he is saying that God is creating spiritual polygamy, because we are separate brides. Israel is God's bride, and those saved in the grace dispensation are Christ's bride. Well, since Christ is God that means that Ironside believes that Christ will commit spiritual polygamy the very charge he hurls against Acts 28 dispensationalists, when he readily admits that the Acts 28 dispensationalists accurately explain the one man and one woman relationship as mystery dispensation believers being the body of Christ and prophecy dispensation believers being the bride of Christ. There is no blessedness in Ironside's position. Rather, it is eternal, spiritual fornication that Ironside accuses the Lord Jesus Christ of a very serious charge. In the last chapter of the book of the Revelation, we have added confirmation as to the correctness of the position taken in this paper. In verse 16, our Lord Jesus declares himself as the coming one, saying, I am the root and offspring of David, the bright and morning star. In the very next verse we are told, and the spirit and the bride say, come. Here we have the church's response to our Lord's declaration that he is the morning star. No. In the previous chapter, the bride was defined as Holy Jerusalem, which is the nation of the believing remnant of Israel alone. It is saved Israel that says, come. In other words, saved Israel is anxious to receive their new bodies. This is no different than the body of Christ today. Paul says, for our conversation is in heaven, 
from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, Philippians 3 verses 20 to 21. Although we are still physically on this earth, God says we are already in heaven, and it is from that position in heaven that we wait for Christ to come to the earth, pick up our vile body, and fashion it like his glorious body. Similarly, the bride, the believing remnant of Israel, is in holy. Jerusalem in heaven and is waiting for Christ to come to give them their new bodies, marry them, and bring them into God's kingdom on earth. The morning star shines out before the rising of the sun. It is as the morning star Christ comes for his church. Chapter and verse, please. Paul never refers to Jesus as the morning star. Jesus is only called the morning star in Revelation 2 verse 28 and 22 16. It is a reference to his coming after the night of tribulation to set up the kingdom on earth for Israel. Matthew 14 verse 25 says Jesus comes in the fourth watch of the night, which is at the end of the night. 2 Peter 3 verse 10 says that Jesus comes as a thief in the night. Psalm 30 verse 5 says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Therefore, the term morning star relates specifically to Jesus' second coming when the night of the tribulation period is over. Furthermore, Paul makes a contrast between the tribulation saints and us, the body of Christ. With regard to the tribulation saints, he says that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 2. Then, he provides the contrast of, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day, we are not of the night, nor of darkness. 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 4 to 5. Therefore, the body of Christ is raptured up before the tribulation period starts, while believing Israel must endure the night of the tribulation before the morning star sets up God's kingdom on earth. Unto Israel, he will arise as the son of righteousness, with healing in his wings. And so here the moment the announcement is made which indicates his near return, people assume that this is an announcement of Jesus' near return. That is not true. Jesus does not say, I am coming soon. Rather, he says, surely I come quickly, Revelation 22 verse 20, meaning that, when it is time, he will come with quickness. That is why the five virgins without oil in their lamps do not have time to go get the oil, Matthew 25 verses 6 to 13. The Spirit who dwells in the church, and the bride actuated by the Spirit, cry with eager longing, Come, for the word is addressed to him. How truly absurd it would be to try to bring Israel in here as though the earthly people were those responding to the Savior's voice during this present age. The absurdity is Ironsides in trying to bring the body of Christ into a book that is distinctly Jewish in nature, being written to Israel in their program only. Revelation 1 verse 1 says the book of Revelation is written to God's servants. Galatians 4 verse 7 says that, Today, in the dispensation of grace, thou art no more a servant, but a son. Therefore, revelation cannot be written to us. Furthermore, even someone giving revelation only a cursory glance can tell it is Jewish in nature. The 144,000 sealed are of all the tribes of the children of Israel, Revelation 7 verse 4. God makes them priests of God, Revelation 20 verse 6 which is a promise God made specifically to the children of Israel, Exodus 19 verses 5 to 6. Since the bride is Israel, as previously proven, it is Israel crying for Jesus to come. This cry is also seen in Revelation 6 verses 9 to 10, where martyred saints during the tribulation period are seen under the altar in heaven asking God, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell in the earth? Therefore, the bride says, come, because it does not want to see others martyred for Christ, and it wants to see thy kingdom come to earth, Matthew 6 verse 10. But so determined are these ultra-dispensationalists to take from the church everything that is found in the book of Revelation, that they even insist that the letters addressed to the churches in chapters 2 and 3 are all for Israel too. Why wouldn't the letters in Revelation be addressed to Israel? All we are doing is believing what God has said. Revelation 1 verse 4 says, John to the seven churches, which are in Asia. What gives Ironside the right to change God's word into a lie by saying, well, the book of Revelation is not really written to seven churches in Asia as God said it is. 
Rather, they are written to seven church ages that will come before the rapture. That is utter blasphemy. As far as taking things away from the church is concerned, we are already blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 3. Meanwhile, God has promised blessings to Israel in earthly places in Christ. One of those blessings is given in Revelation 1 verse 6, which says that God has made Israel kings and priests. This goes right along with the kingdom dispensation in which Israel will be a kingdom of priests to the Gentiles, as Exodus 19 verse 6 says, Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. How dare Ironside say, sorry, Israel, God ain't. Giving you squat. God is only blessing the body of Christ. However, by rightly dividing the word of truth, we rightly recognize the blessings God has given to us, the body of Christ, as identified in Romans, Philemon, and the blessings God has given to Israel, some of which are mentioned in the book of Revelation. Therefore, it is Ironside who is robbing saints of God, Israel, of their blessings not the dispensationalists. Ignoring the fact that the Apostle John had labored for years in the Roman proconsular province of Asia, that he was thoroughly familiar with all these seven churches, before, Ironside said they represent seven church ages. Is he now changing his position to say that they are seven literal churches? Ironside has no qualms about freely changing the word of God back and forth to match his philosophies. They nevertheless even go so far as to deny that some of these churches had any existence in the first century of the Christian era, when John wrote the Apocalypse, although Sir William Ramsey's researches have proven the contrary. The seven churches existed at the time of the writing of Revelation, and they will all exist in the future tribulation period, as well just like the twelve tribes of Israel existed at the writing of the Revelation, and they will exist in the future tribulation period, Revelation 7 verses 3 to 8, dot. On the other hand, they declare that all of these churches are to rise up in the future after the body has been removed to heaven, and that then the seven letters will have their application, but have no present bearing upon the consciences of the saints. It is not the dispensationalists who came up with this, Rather, God says that John wrote to the seven churches in Asia and the warnings pertain to the tribulation period. Therefore, by God's writing, the seven churches must both have existed at the time of the writing and will exist during the future tribulation period. To believe anything else is to change God's word into a lie. As mentioned, the same holds true for the twelve tribes of Israel. Today, no Jew can tell what tribe he is from, yet God is able to tell such that he seals 12,000 from each tribe halfway through the tribulation period, Revelation 7 verses 3 to 8. Furthermore, exactly how do the seven letters have a present bearing upon the consciences of the saints? For example, if the seven letters are written to us today, how do we apply thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols, Revelation. 220? I cannot conceive of anything more satanic than this. So, according to Ironside, the most satanic thing he can think of is for man to believe God's word is true. Here are some things in the Bible that Ironside may want to reclassify as being a bit more satanic than believing God's word. 1. Kids killed in the hands of an idol to appease the god, Molech. Jeremiah 32 verse 35, 2, a woman raped repeatedly by a crowd of men all night and being left for dead, Judges 19 verses 22 to 28, and 3, men cutting themselves until blood gushes out to get the attention of their God, Baal, 1 Kings 18 verses 27 to 28. However, Ironside may say those are fairy tales, since he does not believe the Bible is true. Here are churches actually raised up of God through the preaching of the gospel, True, but they believed the gospel of the kingdom, repent and be baptized, Acts 2 verse 38, rather than the gospel of grace, believe in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sins, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4. Each one of the seven churches is told to overcome, Revelation 2 colon 7, 11, 17, 26, and 3 colon 5, 12, 21, yet, today, we are told, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory, through our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 57.
Ephesus we know well, Laodicea is mentioned in the letter to the Colossians. Since Paul and Barnabas went to the heathen and the twelve apostles went to the circumcision, Galatians 2 verse 9, the churches addressed by John must be different congregations than the ones Paul addressed, even if they were in the same city. The other churches we may be sure existed at the time and in exactly the state that John depicts, and the risen Christ addresses these churches in the most solemn way, and seven times over calls upon all exercised souls to give heed to what he says to each one, crying, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. In these letters, we had depicted every possible condition in which the churches of God can be found from apostolic days to the end of the Christian era. Okay. So, Ironside is changing back to saying that the seven churches represent seven church ages. More than that, we have in a mystic way, so, now Ironside is following mysticism? By saying the instructions in Revelation 2-3 are mystic, he can make them mean whatever he wants them to mean. For example, Pergamos is said to dwell even where Satan's seat is, Revelation 2 verse 13. If we take this literally, we can understand that they are in the area where the Antichrist's throne is during the tribulation period. However, if you change this to the time period of 312 to 590 AD, as biblical scholars do today, you have to say that Satan's seat means something entirely different. If the letters are mystic, you can make them mean whatever fits your fancy, and no one can question you, the moral and spiritual principles of the entire course of church history portrayed. Really? And, what principles are those? More bad things are mentioned than good among the seven churches. The only good things mentioned are the following. Revelation 2 verse 3 mentions patience and laboring. Revelation 2 verse 13 mentions not denying Jesus' faith. Revelation 2 verse 19 mentions charity, service, faith, and patience. Revelation 3 verse 8 says they have kept Jesus' word and have not denied his name. All we can gather, then, are a few spiritual principles that are given in a general way. That is why I have never heard anyone apply the spiritual principles mentioned to the so-called seven church ages, because it cannot be done. Furthermore, why should we look to the faulty seven churches for moral and spiritual principles when we can look to the perfect spiritual principles given to us today in Paul's epistles? We can glean more spiritual principles out of Galatians 5 verses 22 to 23 the fruit of the Spirit, then we can out of the whole of Revelation 2-3. All this should have immense weight with us as believers, and should speak loudly to our consciences, if we apply Revelation 2-3 to us today and try to get it to speak to our consciences, the result will be the negation of sound doctrine for us today, given by the Apostle Paul. For example, Romans 5 verse 11 says that we have now received the atonement while Revelation 2 verse 5 warns the Ephesian church that, if they do not repent and do the first works, Jesus will remove a candlestick out of his place. Thus, if we allow this verse to speak loudly to our consciences, it would negate the promise of eternal life that we already have and replace it with a fear of losing our salvation. But along comes the Bullingerite and, with a wave of his interpretative wand, dismisses them entirely for the present age, airily declaring that they have no message for us whatever, that they are all Jewish, and will only have their place in the Great Tribulation after the Church is gone. Not after the Church is gone, but after the Body of Christ is gone, at which time, God promises to save Israel and bring them into God's Kingdom, Romans 11 verse 26. If anyone needs instruction in God's word, it is Israel in the tribulation period, when deception will be so strong that, if it were, possible, they shall deceive the very elect, Matthew 24 verse 24. Besides, we have plenty of instruction in Paul's epistles that almost 100% of Christians have no clue about. Why not obey the command of 2 Timothy 2 verse 7 to consider what Paul says in order to give us understanding in all things, instead of robbing Israel of instructions that are for written specifically to them in a time when those instructions are most needed. And thus the people of God who accept the unscriptural system, what is unscriptural about the Acts 9 position? Since John clearly indicates that Revelation was written to the Jews, it would be inaccurate to try to apply Revelation to us today. At the same time, this does not mean that nothing can be learned from Revelation today, as all scripture is profitable, 2 Timothy 3 verse 16.
are robbed of not only the precious things in which these letters bound, but their consciences become indifferent to the solemn admonitions found therein. If Revelation 2-3 applies to us today, then how am I supposed to apply the solemn admonition of Revelation 2 verse 5 to my conscience? Should I ignore Paul's instruction that, I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God, Galatians 2 verse 19, and do the first works instead, Revelation 2 verse 5, constantly getting resaved, such that I do not live unto God, since I am worried about my own salvation? Surely this is a masterpiece of satanic strategy, the masterpiece of Satan's strategy is to get people to be scriptural, but not dispensational. Satan wants people to follow Matthew, John, rationalizing that they are following God's word today, since they are following the red letters, while criticizing Paul's epistles, even though what Paul writes are the commandments of the Lord for us today. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37. No doubt that, in the tribulation period, when it is time to apply revelation, Satan's strategy will be to get people to follow Paul's letters. Religion will then say, you now have the Atonement, Romans 5 verse 11. You are not under the law, but under grace, Romans 6 verse 14. Do not be afraid to take the mark. It is not the mark of the beast, but it is a security measure to prevent identity theft. Go ahead and worship the image, because an idol is nothing, 1 Corinthians 8 verse 4. Besides, it is of the Virgin Mary, and the Christ wants you to worship her. Whereby under the plea of rightly dividing the word of truth, the scriptures are so wrongly divided that they cease to have any message for God's people today, and the word of the Lord is made of no effect by this unscriptural tradition. First, Midax dispensationalism is not unscriptural tradition. We have already seen that Paul says that, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 17, and that what Paul received was by the revelation of Jesus Christ, Galatians 1 verse 12. God says to rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, and that, in order to understand the whole Bible, we must consider what Paul says, 2 Timothy 2 verse 7. Therefore, it is only by mid-acts dispensationalism that the whole Bible becomes clear. Instead of trying to mysticize Revelation 2-3 to to make these chapters give some vague principles from the last 2,000 years, we can see that they are really giving specific instructions to Israel in the tribulation period. It is interesting that Ironside mentions that right division makes the word of the Lord of no effect, because that is exactly what Ironside is doing by not rightly dividing. He is pushing a religious system that changes God's word to fit man's traditions, to cater to the flesh in order to make the word of God of none effect. This is exactly what Jesus said that the religious people of his day were doing with the word of God. Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition, Mark 7 verse 9, and making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, Mark 7 verse 13. Finally, Ironside's assertion that right division makes the word of God cease from having a message for God's people today is also utterly false. By rightly dividing, we can understand Paul's epistles. Paul's epistles give different doctrine than the rest of the Bible because they are in a different dispensation. When you put Matthew, John above all other scripture, you end up changing Paul's epistles to fit Matthew, John. You also do not believe everything in Matthew, John, such as sell that ye have, and give alms, Luke 12 verse 33, and the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, all therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, Matthew 23 verses 2 to 3. Therefore, Ironside is changing the whole Bible to fit his religion. Also, we need to note that just because all scripture is for us today, 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 to 17, it is not all written to us today. In fact, we are specifically told that Israel's history is in scripture for our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 6. Therefore, we can read the Old Testament, believe what it says, and learn the spiritual lessons behind their examples, rather than trying to. Change what the verses say, yielding to another spirit, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 4, so that the verses are somehow written directly to us. Such treatment makes the word of God cease to have a message from God for us today, and leaves it up to the willy-nilly fantasies of religious zealots. And yet the Lord in instructing John, says, write the things which are. It is the present continuous tense. 
It might be rendered, the things which are now going on. Not at all, exclaims the Bullingerite. These are the things which are not going on, neither will they have any place so long as the Church of God is on earth. First, when Revelation is written, the time is at hand for those things which are written therein, Revelation 1 verse 3, because Revelation was written before Acts 9, and they have been put on hold for 2,000 years, due to the unbelief of Israel. Second, Revelation 1 verse 19 says, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Most people think this means past, present, and future, but it does not. Hebrews 11 verse 3 says that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. In other words, God made a good creation, but the things of Satan in the tribulation period are not of God. From this perspective, we can see that the things of Revelation 1 verse 19 are all one group not three groups. The things which are are the things that exist of God's creation that are in heavenly places. Those things shall be hereafter on the earth, after Satan's kingdom is destroyed. These are the things that John saw. Therefore, the things which are is a reference to the pure things that God has created, which are in heaven now, due to man's corrupting of the earth, and that will appear later on earth, once Satan and his forces are cast out of the earth. Ironside's changing of the word of God to the things which are now going on makes no sense, since the things of the tribulation period are still future. Others may accept this as deep teaching and advanced truth. Even history tells you that the things of Revelation were not going on at the time of its writing, as Ironside maintains. Personally, I reject it as a satanic perversion, calculated to destroy the power of the Word of God over the souls of his people.